Welcome to the Food Junkies Podcast. Here, we aim to provide you with the experience, strength, and hope of professionals actively working on the front lines in the field of food addiction. The purpose of our show is to educate you, the listener, and increase overall awareness about food addiction as a disease with abstinence as the solution. Here, we talk about all things recovery. Most importantly, how to thrive rather than just survive. So stay positive, make a change for yourself, tell others about your change, and hopefully the message will spread. Hey there, Food Junkies listeners, Molly here. Today, Vera does a solo interview with Dr. Rachel Brown, NHS consultant psychiatrist in Scotland. Vera and Dr. Rachel Brown talk about Dr. Brown's personal and professional journey, her vegan to carnivore path, metabolic health and nutritional psychiatry, the gut, dysfunctional brain metabolism, carb sensitivity and bioindividuality, intermittent fasting, medications, sweeteners, her book, Metabolic Madness, Understand Why Metabolic Health is Key to Mental Health, Your Keys to Success, What's Next for Dr. Brown, and our signature question. All right, take it away, Vera. Welcome to the Food Junkies podcast. My name is Dr. Vera Tarman, and I am your host for today's talk with Dr. Rachel Brown. Dr. Brown is a consultant psychiatrist in the UK and an expert in metabolic psychiatry. She is also known as the carnivore shrink. Dr. Brown graduated from Edinburgh University in 2003 and has worked in the field of psychiatry since then. She also has a master's degree in medical law and ethics. She is a certified functional medicine practitioner and is both researcher and advocate for the use of therapeutic carbohydrate restriction to treat mental disorders. In other words, she wants to treat the underlying metabolic and gut disorders that she believes are the key causes for mental disorders. Dr. Brown is also author of Metabolic Madness, Understand Why Metabolic Health is Key to Mental Health and Your Keys to Success. Okay, so thank you and welcome to Coming to Food Junkies. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. Okay, so um, if you don't mind, I'd like to start with some personal information. We always like to get the personal backstory before we get to the theory and concepts. So what is your story, particularly moving from general psychiatry to metabolic or nutritional psychiatry? Because it's still pretty much a niche. So how did you get into it? Yeah, so I must say, I still am an NHS psychiatrist, so I'm still working within general psychiatry, but my real passion and interest lies with metabolic psychiatry. Um, So I came to that partly for personal reasons, because I have been following a low-carbohydrate diet for many years now, um, certainly consistently for the last 10, and then very strictly ketogenic diet for the last six years. But I was lucky enough to go on training with Dr. Georgia Ede in January 2021, and that really kind of fueled my interest in continuing with metabolic psychiatry and trying to further the field in that regard. I'm also currently involved in a a pilot clinical study um, locally in Edinburgh, um, looking into the ketogenic diet and its use in bipolar disorder. Um, So so that's really exciting to be a part of. And I think I'm right in saying that the metabolic psychiatry field is really gaining some momentum, particularly in the last six months to a year, um, partly In fact, a lot to do with the the funding that's come from the Bazooki Foundation and the Bazooki family who are funding um, research trials across the globe. Oh, that's 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 wonderful when you can get somebody to find um, sort of unique research. And then once you get funding and once you get research, then people start listening. Yes, absolutely. So somewhere in your history, I seem to have seen, maybe you can correct me, or and if it's true, please tell us the development, that you were actually a, a vegan at one point. So that oh, was yeah. like completely not keto. So how did you go from yeah. that all the way to the keto? Yeah, that's a really good question. It's probably one of my biggest regrets. In fact, the biggest regret health-wise was experimenting with a vegan diet. And I was vegan, I forget for how long. I think it was between a year and 18 months, there or thereabouts. I remember it was back in 2010 or thereabouts, but I'd actually been interested in low-carb nutrition since Atkins was out in the early kind of 2000s. And I think I strayed away from that primarily due to my own sugar addiction, um, if I'm being completely candid about it. And I ended up becoming vegan. It was was 
just a sequence of events where I'd been on holiday with my husband and we'd been in Portugal and I remember we we ate at all these delicious fish restaurants and I remember thinking oh this must be so healthy all the fish and seafood that we're eating so I, I started to look into pescatarianism and then that led me down the rabbit hole of vegetarianism and veganism and mm. I ended up just reading the wrong resources in retrospect so that's how I got into experimenting with a vegan diet and I say it was my worst health decision ever yeah. because it's interesting statement <laughs> Oh gosh, it's a long time ago now, but I had body composition changes that weren't positive. So I gained a bit of weight. I, I wasn't, I don't think I was ever overweight, but I didn't have much muscle definition. I definitely had body composition changes um, in terms of laying down more fat that wasn't ideal. I remember feeling hungry most of the time. And at the time I felt that, oh, the vegan diet was so good. I remember got, I got into cooking lots of different recipes and I had various vegan recipe books and I used to think oh it's so satisfying when you eat and I think that's because in retrospect I was just so hungry all the time uh -huh. and and really in retrospect I, I could never really find food that would really satiate me properly on, on on any level it's also the only time in my life when I came down with the flu and was and was quite unwell with that and I don't think that's a coincidence that that's the only time in in my life where I've I've been that sick from the flu or from a virus and then various other you know issues like PMS was worse you know wow. just hormonal type difficulties and, and just because you're a psychiatrist did you notice that your mood changed as well just out of curiosity um, not that I remember specifically apart from to do with PMS. Yes. Um, so I think I think it was more obvious there. And then kind of hair and nails. I remember my nails were incredibly thin and brittle. And oh. there, were, there were lots of uh, signs at the time that I probably should have paid more attention to. Okay, so then you went from uh, vegan all the way, not just keto, but carnivore. Like you identify as the carnivore shrink. So the carnivore yes. is like almost no carbohydrates at all. Am I right? Yes, that's right. So yeah, I've been a huge follower of Mark Sisson for many years. So Mark's Daily Apple, absolutely love everything that he does. And um, I've read all of his books in terms of ancestral health, and I really enjoy his approach to everything. So I'd followed him for quite a number of years and, and found myself to be low carb, but not strictly ketogenic. And then it was about six years ago now that I I looked into the ketogenic diet more and decided to commit to trying that myself. And I just stumbled upon carnivore um, when I had some involvement with Vanessa Spinner. Mm -hmm. I think you may have done an interview with previously um, ketogenic girl. So I liked some of her food plans and joined her Facebook group and was in contact with her. And it was actually via Vanessa that I saw her doing a carnivore experiment at one time. And I never heard of carnivore before that. And um, I really trust Vanessa's opinion on, on and knowledge in terms of the ketogenic diet. So I thought, I thought to myself, there must be something in this, so I'm going to look into it more. And I actually came to Carnivore just over three years ago now. So when I when I decided to look into it, I watched a, a talk by Michaela Peterson at Carnivory Con when she just detailed her personal experience um, of all her autoimmune disorders and her mental health disorders resolving on a strict carnivore diet. And then I also saw a talk by Dr. Sean Baker. I think that was at another Carnivory Con event. But anyway, the, the, the talks were online and he just made such a good argument for all the flaws in terms of our nutritional paradigms in the mainstream and, and the, the research into nutrition. And I, I, it was just curiosity. I thought, oh, I'm just going to try this and, and let's see what happens. Uh, and, and just for our listeners uh, who may not know, so carnivore is like almost exclusively proteins and fats, right? Like, Yes, yes. Yeah. So it's all um, animal-based foods. So um, my own diet is a lot of, a lot of red meat, um, but I also include eggs and butter, so very high-fat dairy yes. uh, I'm okay with. But it's, it's been very eye-opening for me because it, going carnivore really highlighted to me the extent of my difficulties with sugar over the years or food addiction more generally, because even when I was keto, I still had some residual food addiction type issues um, with yeah. certain foods. I, I remember reading that you had written something about how uh, chocolate and almond butter and the uh, keto Atkins bars got you into trouble. Is that what you're referring yes. to? Yes. Yeah, so, so my memory, when I think back to, gosh, 20 years or so ago when I was doing Atkins, 
some of the days I could only really get through by buying Atkins chocolate type bars and yeah. they would always end up derailing me. And, and I, yeah, it wasn't until I really went carnivore that it became so clear to me what had been going on all that time and why, why had I found it so difficult to stick with Atkins consistently all those years ago. And, and it was, it was absolutely a sugar addiction yeah. um, that I just didn't have control of. So I, I do want to talk more about sugar addiction after we talk a little bit more about the sort of metabolic angle. But just just because we're talking personal right now, would you say that with your current carnivore diet or food plan or lifestyle that your food addiction is quiet? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So I don't have any preoccupation with food at all. Yeah. Um, I don't have any compulsive behavior around foods. Food has become, it, it's still pleasurable, but I wouldn't, you know, I, for many years, I mistook myself as an emotional eater, not not fully recognizing that it was actually an addiction. And I don't have any issues around emotional eating. Um, I eat purely out of physical hunger and yeah. eat to satiety. And then I don't think about food for hours until I'm hungry again. It's just become a very easy relationship with food and, and just very simple. Yeah, it's it's really interesting how you describe your personal story about how you had beliefs about things that later you realized that wasn't actually that. It was like your emotional eating uh, relationship, that it was actually not emotional eating, but in fact, food addiction. Because a lot of the general population, I think, would fit into that category saying, I'm not a food addict. I just eat for comfort, for emotional yeah. reasons. And uh, there you are realizing it, but you had to get over on this side. Yeah, um, and I, I spent years reading you know, endless books about emotional eating. And, and um, I had a whole bookshelf full of the <laughs> full of the books and some really interesting books out there with helpful tips. But after a year or two of carnivore, I just I just realized I don't need to keep these anymore, even for reference. Just yeah. let's just spin them all. Um, yeah. um, so. Okay, so let, let's get to the concept of metabolic health for our listeners. So can you please explain, so you talk about the gut-brain axis, and, mm -hmm. and if you could explain what that means and how that relates to psychiatry, and especially in contrast to traditional psychiatry. That's a big question, so wherever you want to start. Okay. Yeah, so, so I've obviously been trained as a traditional psychiatrist and came through mainstream allopathic med medical training and although we had to cover basic sciences for our, our kind of Royal College membership exams, never in my training or in my many years of working subsequently as a consultant had I really come across or properly considered the gut-brain connection. And it wasn't really until I studied functional medicine that I started to think about this in much more depth. Um, so... I mean, our gut and our brain are interlinked. So there's there's a clear physical connection between the two in the form of the vagal nerve, but also the there's bi-directional communication. So your brain communicates with your gut and your gut communicates with your brain through various mechanisms. So hormonal, um, endocrine, neural mechanisms, it's all very complex. Mm -hmm. um, and by that you're and, talking and, about leptin and ghrelin and, and CCK and all those sort of that. Yes. Whole, okay. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, the vast majority of our neurotransmitters are manufactured in our gut by the microbiome and the bacteria that exist there. Yeah. To be honest, I don't really know why I hadn't thought about that more in all these years of working as a psychiatrist and working clinically in psychiatry, but I, I don't even... I don't really recall that being spoken about even when I was learning all the theory in terms of mainstream practice of psychiatry, but possibly some others were aware of that back then. I, I just didn't, I didn't seem to be or else I'd forgotten about it. You, you know, um, I think that like just coming from a traditional background too, the only place that I remember learning about the sort of neurotransmitters more abundant in the gut was in terms of relevance was, yeah, when you take a medication, people feel nauseous. They feel yeah. initially, and that was it. It was just because that might explain the gut reaction to something that was in the brain. But you're yes. saying it's much more complicated than that. Oh yeah, absolutely. Because Having studied functional medicine, my view would be that gut health is absolutely key to health overall. So not just mental health, but everything really in the body. Um, I know some people refer to it as the second brain, but I, I think it's just as vital <laughs> as the brain if you want to start making arguments that mm -hmm. way. And my view is also that many chronic diseases are related to less than optimal gut health, leaky gut um, or intestinal permeabil permeability. And then there are all sorts of 
immune cascades that happen when you have a leaky gut and less than optimal kind of bacterial proteins leak across your gut barrier into the bloodstream and, and it can trigger off a whole cascade of inflammatory immune mediators such as cytokines and that can have effects at sites quite distant from the gut, including the brain. So, so just to go, uh, slow down, uh, slow you down a little bit, and for, mm-hmm. for our listeners who may not know a lot of this stuff, so you mentioned the vagal nerve. There's that immediate connection. How might yes. that relate to what you eat, your gut, and how might that affect the brain? Like, just maybe give an example, just so somebody knows what you mean when you say vagal nerve. So the vagal nerve is obviously the sort of hardwired connection between the gut and the brain. But I think essentially everything that we put into our bodies comes in in contact with the gut. Um, So I primarily think about food, but you you could think about other substances as well. The traditional view, maybe going off topic slightly, but the traditional view is that you need to have a very high fibre diet in order to feed your gut and to keep your bacteria in your gut happy and to feed your microbiome. But actually, I think that's an overly simplistic view. and, And my own personal view would be to argue against that. And part of the reason for that is just the improvements I've seen in my own health through going zero carb or carnivore, which really means I'm eating a diet with little to no fibre in at all. The science that gets uh, spoken about really in relation to keeping the gut microbiome happy is that fibre uh, makes the bacteria produce short-chain fatty acids, mm-hmm. um, and, and these are healthy for the gut and healthy for the body. But actually, there are other, there are other aspects of your diet that can can lead to a healthy balance of short chain fatty acids as well, such as ghee and butter. And I can only assume from my own health improvements I've had personally, um, one of which has been a vastly improved immune system and immune health, is that I had a degree of gut dysbiosis before changing my diet quite significantly and that there have been positive changes there. Okay, and so for people not knowing what that means, that means okay. the gut that it, not our normal gut, but it that has been yeah. altered because of processed foods or, or inappropriate foods. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I think there's a lot that we still don't know about the gut. So I think research is in its infancy in that way. But, you know, I I think there are certain things that we do know about the gut. And, you know, there are certain classes of bacteria that we know are positively associated with good health states. And we equally know that there are certain conditions where there might be alterations in in the balance of good versus less than optimal gut bacteria. Like, for example, just to jump on that point, like one of the types of bacteria that's written a lot about is fermiticutes. Is that how you say it? Fermit- yeah, or Firmicutes. I, I'm not it. sure yeah. of the exact pronunciation. Which, which is associated with obesity, I believe. Yes. And, and yes. Uh, processed food causes the gut dysbiosis so that there's an overabundance of this, and which is one of the explanations for obesity. Is that correct? Yes, that's my understanding. And also, I, I think there are some studies that show an association with depression. Yes, some that's other... what I was going to get to. It's the same one. Yeah. Yes, yes. And I, I'm always a little bit cautious just when talking about certain bacteria in the gut because I, I, I am conscious that I think we don't know everything yet. But again, taking it back to personal experience, I know that a lot of people go through transition symptoms when they move to carnivore. And that can include, you know, gastrointestinal type side effects initially. And I had that myself moving from keto. And I just can't really see how that could be explained by anything other than really having shifts in your gut microbiome or the bacteria in your gut. Uh Uh, Can can I ask you a question about that? So one of the things that people talk about, but the carnivores say, no, it's not a problem, is they get really constipated. So is that an example of how the constipation can resolve itself because other bacteria are finally being allowed to proliferate? Oh, so it was actually, it actually tends to be more diarrhea that a lot of people really? have difficulties with. Yes. So that was, it was the opposite and it was the opposite for me as well. So I had difficulties with diarrhea intermittently for a few weeks in the beginning. And, uh, but I, I do know there's a lot of personal variations. So I know other people who really just had one day of that issue. And I think the general view or the 
the assumption that people would make is if you completely exclude fibre from your diet that you will become constipated and yeah. also that meat, meat is constipating but that's absolutely not been my experience and my understanding is that it's not the experience of the vast majority um, of people following the carnivore diet either. Right and if it is somebody's experience it, it might be something else that's going on but it could also be that there's bacteria that need to readjust or realign themselves. Yes, um, that's possible. I know there are some workarounds. So sometimes it can be somebody's not eating enough fat. Oh, yes. um, so it, it can be partly just getting the, the protein and fat ratios. Got it. Okay. Proper balance. All right. So just to go back to that vagal nerve. So you've talked a little bit about leaky gut and gut dysbiosis, both things that you talk a lot about in metabolic health, your book, or metabolic madness. But the vagal thing, when I think vagal, I think relaxation. Does that somehow get I've always thought, and I think I'm quite simplistic in my thinking, but that this might be a reason why people like to eat because it promotes the vagal response, which is a relaxation response. So hence, yeah. eating causes comfort and relaxation. What's your thought about that? Oh, yeah. Interesting concept. I had, I've never really considered that before, but yeah. yes, that would make sense to me. Yeah. Um, Especially I don't really... addictions. People that really want to eat a lot. The okay. Receptors, yes. Is yeah. a possibility? Yeah, I think so. I could see that. Again, I, I'm not I'm not 100% sure, but it does seem to make logical sense. Okay. But it, so so you have been talking about gut dysbiosis and whatnot. So how does that relate now to mood? Like you said that you you're doing some research with bipolar disorder and gut dysbiosis. So explain how what you eat can affect your mood. Please. Yeah, so we know primarily from animal studies in terms of looking at the gut microbiome that animal models of depression or anxiety disorders. So if, if you were to take germ-free mice, for example, they might exhibit anxiety or depressive type behaviours. And then if they're given a probiotic with a certain class of bacteria, such as lactobacillus or bifidobacterium, they, they tend to be the two different groups that are used. There are research studies out there that show the, the mice or the rat behaviour improves and, and reverts to a more normal sort of behavior and we do know there are there aren't really any randomized controlled trials as such that I'm aware of um, but we do know that their gut dysbiosis or having a less than optimal balance of gut bacteria in the gut has been associated with various mental health disorders such as depression or anxiety um, bipolar disorder autism um, ADHD it, it, yeah, it, yeah. it goes on and on <laughs> Can you say anything more specific about any one of those categories? I mean, I'm really interested in that old belief that we always had that sugar creates or, or exacerbates ADHD. I mean, do you think there is truth to that when, as we learn more about the gut? Oh, yeah. I suppose when I think of sugar and ADHD, I, I think of sugar as having an excitatory adrenaline release type effect um, mm -hmm. on the body. So I could absolutely see why that would be detrimental, particularly in those people with ADHD. But I, I suppose my own personal view is that sugar isn't really an optimal food or diet for anybody uh -huh. um, and is highly addictive. I, I suppose one of my interests is that there are studies and it's not to do specifically with sugar, but that there are differences in kind of omega-6 to omega-3 fatty acid ratios in certain populations, particularly in uh -huh. ADHD and autism. And I suppose that ties into the prevalence of seed oils in our diets and, and the predominance of omega-6, which are the more inflammatory of the essential fatty acids. And so we've known for many years that our ratios are are way out of balance and, and that seems to have been following the introduction of these industrial seed oils into the diet and you tend to find those in processed food okay. um, so the sunflower seed oil and the the rape seed oil or canola oil it might be known as soya bean oil those kind of types of fats so I, I have major concerns about those being particularly detrimental uh, to not just attention deficit but that's an example there oh yeah so, yeah, absolutely. So, so I, I, I'm quite a simplistic thinker as well. So I tend to think of it as if you have too much in the way of an omega three fatty acid balance, or sorry, omega six fatty acid balance, then and um, that just is pro inflammatory and promotes inflammation. And my view of mental disorders is that, is that the vast majority, if not all are inflammatory conditions. Ah, um, that's interesting. Can you elaborate on that? Because that, that is quite unique in the field of psychiatry, I'm sure. Okay. So yeah, I mean, I, th I think the research literature shows that quite clearly that, that patients with 
particularly depression, but I'm sure there are other yes. studies as well and other disorders that show well, raised inflammatory. Yeah. Yes, show raised inflammatory markers, and that can be general inflammatory markers like CRP, but it's also immune mediators, so cytokines. So there, there are certain um, like um, certain interleukins and tumor necrosis factor that tend to be elevated in cohorts with mental disorders, whatever the diagnosis may be. Yeah, it's all it's it kind of all interlinks. <laughs> so how can depression be an inflammatory disorder? Like what's the actual mechanism there? So we've got the inflammatory, like I get that 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 makes arthritis worse. It's potentially it makes Alzheimer's worse, which hopefully we can talk about a bit. But how can it like something like depression, which is supposed to be a serotonin based disease model, how can inflama inflammation affect that? Yes, yeah, so my starting point is always diet. So the modern high carbohydrate, kind of grain focused, processed food focused diets, yes. um, all of those foods, even if it's what people view as potentially healthy whole grains, they all break down into sugar in the body. So you, your digestion breaks down the complex carbohydrates into simple sugars during the process of digestion. And the response in the body, which is the natural response, is to produce more insulin to deal with the sugar or glucose load that you would get in your bloodstream because yes. you, your body doesn't want your bloodstream glucose level to be too high, Yes, um, presumably because it knows it's damaging to be too high. Um, so we do know that high carbohydrate diets and high sugar diets promote inflammation in the body. You end up having something called advanced glycation end products. Mm -hmm. So that is when sugar molecules effectively stick to proteins, um, DNA, collagen even in the body. So I like to I like to tell people sometimes when they're not all that keen about changing their diet if if there's a bit more of a vanity element there that actually advanced glycation end products are implicated in in rapid aging and particularly when they cross link with collagen. But it causes the formation of these products causes dysfunction at a cellular level. It leads to an imbalance in your oxidative stress. So it produces free radicals or reactive oxygen species. And all of this ends up tipping neurotransmitter pathways out of balance. Ah, so okay. although I, I, I think the neurotransmitter theories of mental illness are overly simple and do not explain anything by any means, I do think that they're a piece in the puzzle. Um, and so we do know that inflammation and um, a lot of that can, can come from glucose. Um, it can affect certain pathways. And one example is the kynurinine pathway. So that's involved in the tryptophan metabolism pathway. Right. Which is part of the whole serotonin piece. Yes. Okay. Um, so they're connected. But when your body's in a very high inflammatory state, or there's lots of oxidative stress around, the tryptophan gets diverted down a slightly different arm of the pathway and you end up producing more neurotoxic substances. And then you can end up with excess glutamate in the body and something called kind of glutamate excitotoxicity, excitotoxicity. Oh. So glutamate is the kind of gas pedal in the car, the accelerator. Um, yeah. Think high stress, overactivity, anxiety, unable to concentrate, those, those kind of symptoms. And then GABA would be the yeah. opposite. Yeah. So it would be the relaxation neuro neurotransmitter and you end up having less of that when these uh, pathways are out of balance. Um, yeah. All right. So just to try to summarize this piece, the gut dysbiosis makes it so that whatever element that serotonin plays in depression is impaired or it's not as efficient as possible. Plus, depression is much more than just that because it sounds like the uh, balance of fatty, my God, the essential acids three and six, that yes. balance is important as well. It's more than just the serotonin piece, but even the serotonin piece is affected. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So it's partly neurotransmitter imbalance, but I think a lot yes. of the difficulties in mental health come down to inflammation and oxidative stress. And then the other piece in the puzzle relates to brain energy deficits. You get something called, basically, you end up with insulin resistance, um, which is maybe another concept we might need to explain. But when you're eating a very high carbohydrate diet over a prolonged period of time, your body ends up having to produce more and more insulin to deal yes. with the glucose load. Yes. And you end up in a high insulin state. Yes. And then what can happen is certain 
you know, many cells in the body can become insulin resistant and be unable to effectively use the insulin. And the brain is one of those organs that we know does become insulin resistant. And that's particularly obvious in Alzheimer's from the research, but I think it also happens in other disorders too. So you end up with a you have a phrase that I that I really like: cerebral glucose hypometabolism. Oh, hypometabolism. Yes, yes. So that, yes. that's just it's just not basically getting that sugar. Well, yeah, absolutely. So just kind of dysfunctional brain um, metabolism. So your brain ends ends up being flooded with glucose, but the insulin can't get across the blood-brain barrier. And so the insulin is what's needed to get the glucose into your cells and your brain to use for energy. And they're effectively drowning in glucose, but unable to access the energy that's there. And that's the beauty of ketogenic diets, because ketones can also cross the blood-brain barrier and provide a much cleaner fuel for the brain. Brain, and most of your brain can use ketones as fuel, even um, in the absence of insulin, um, being able to get across the blood-brain barrier. So effectively, people with insulin-resistant brains can use ketones as a clean fuel for energy. Right. And, then, and that's why cognition and concentration and brain fog and all of those difficulties can improve uh, when somebody and, manages and, to change. And potentially their mood as well. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so Absolutely. it's almost like the keto diet is just to make it really simple is essentially a, the best antidepressant you can do, like much, much more effective than throwing in more serotonin with a serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Well, yeah, I, I would say so, because I, I would say you're actually addressing underlying root causes of the dysfunction that's led to depression in the first place. I mean, I, I do know that antidepressants, I do see them helping patients in my clinical practice. Um, but I don't know that it's necessarily to do with their specific action on neurotransmitters. I, th- I think there's some evidence that they are anti-inflammatory and some have some anti-inflammatory effects themselves. Yes, um, and can impact on levels of BDNF, for example, so brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which mm-hmm. is involved in neuroplasticity and regeneration of neurons and brain cells. And um, so I, I think it's a lot more complex. Um, the reasons behind why some people may benefit from antidepressants. But okay. I, my way of thinking is just always to try to treat the underlying cause and always ask why is somebody unwell in the first place. And, I, and so the starting point I always come back to is that it would be better to deal with the problem at its root than, than just be using a medication to treat symptoms, but not necessarily addressing any of the underlying kind of major inflammation or kind of whatever it may be underlying the disorder, like the leaky gut or the the kind of immune cascades that are happening. Just uh, this is a question I've always had. Maybe you can speak to this. I think you kind of alluded to this, actually. Are some people just more carb sensitive than others? Like the the inflammatory response and all of these negative qualities are just more quick to happen for some people than others, like either geographic or ethnic or genetic. Is there something where some people just, they can, they can eat rice, they can do all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Vegans who thrive, there are actually people, well, you must know in the the internet world that there's tons of communities of people who say they feel super fantastic on a vegan diet and others like you who just did not thrive at all. And could it be that there's something uniquely, well, individual? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think everyone's very bio-individual. I don't think for a minute that everybody needs to have the same diet. I think people should always try to look for the solution that fits them best. But I I suppose just when you were asking that there, I was thinking we see it just in terms of physical metabolic health. So you could feed 100 people the same high-carb diet and only, only some of them will develop metabolic syndrome with obvious central yes. obesity and high blood pressure and there will there will be others who get away with it although having said that not everyone who's thin and looks outwardly hmm. healthy is necessarily excluded from having insulin resistance so hmm. i think we don't do a very good job at actually detecting insulin resistance because i think we're testing for the wrong things in mainstream practice so we're measuring blood glucose levels and we might do an hba1c oh. but Nobody's checking to see someone's lithium, uh, sorry, insulin levels, and that, those could be markedly elevated in someone who actually outwardly looks looks well. Right. Um, yeah. Okay. Basically, we've talked about how eating processed refined foods can cause a disturbance with gut health, which can then lead to depression and Alzheimer's and whatnot. And so the solution, obviously, is to eat something that, well, basically 
divert the whole process by going on a keto plan and using ketones instead. That's a very quick healing. What about yeah. something like intermittent fasting? What's your thought about that? I know you've written a little bit about that. Yeah, so I think fasting can be a, a very powerful tool. Um, I don't know necessarily that I would jump into recommending it for mental health purposes because I think some people can run into difficulties um, having a cortisol spike. There obviously there'll be a if you're hungry, folks. Just so people know know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. You get, you get, it's a stressful response to be hungry. Yes. Yeah. yeah so fasting is a, a stressor on the body, and but there are obviously health benefits that come with it in terms of autophagy and your body's own kind of cleanup system in terms of its cells and so somebody who might be healing from many years of chronic disease there might be a role to use fasting in those situations but I, I suppose I'm also aware that there's quite a high prevalence of eating disorders and, yeah. and fasting isn't necessarily a good idea for people who have a history of being particularly restrictive and I would worry about about recommending regular fasting for somebody in, in that situation who might be restricting yeah. too much and not, not getting enough in the way of calories in or and macronutrients. It, it, one of the things that I'm always on about when I hear people talking quite willy nilly about, I should just fast or I'm going to do, you know, do this to lose weight, whatever, is that uh, it's a powerful tool and it should be done with the help of a clinician or somebody who knows, especially if you have a history of food addiction or eating disorder, because it can trigger a binge. It can trigger behaviors that make things worse. It's it's a powerful tool, but it can backfire. Yes. Yeah, I would absolutely agree with that. I kind of experimented with intermittent fasting myself, but I've moved away from that now entirely just because I, I don't think it did me any favors in terms of hormonally. And I think it can be different for women. So, you know, you see some people who go one meal a day for extended periods of time, which is obviously fasting for 20 plus hours, maybe 23 yes. hours every single day. And I do know from certain people out there in the community who are kind of experts in this, particularly in female health, that um, there are obviously nuances there in terms of menstrual cycle and time of life. And so it is a stressor on the body. And I think a lot depends on your other stress levels in, in your life as well. So it's about picking the optimum time as well to do that. What what would be your ideal recommendation for a window period? Like, tell me what what's a, <laughs> okay. you know, like restricted um, window period. So I, I think I think a lot of people out there, and if it's weight loss or if it's trying to optimize metabolic health overall, I think a simple kind of sixteen eight sort of having an eight hour eating window and sixteen yeah. hour fasting can work really well for a lot of people. I think if it's more autophagy or those kind of benefits, then you're looking more towards a, a 20 hour fast. A okay. fast. And if okay. it's for ultra healing, then I think actually extended fasts tend to be better. So, hmm. um, you know, some people do alternate day fasts, but I, I suppose I'm thinking of the longer fasts even still. Yeah. So two or three days, for example. Yeah. Um, and I know some people who do that once a year or twice a year, just in terms of overall healing. Okay, good. So that we talked about that. Now, I wanted to ask you, what's your opinion about, I don't, I'm sure you've read Dr. William Davis. He's the one that wrote, oh my gosh, was that brain? I can't remember what his brain, was it green brain? Yeah, I think so. Anyway, he talks brain? about his probiotic uh, yogurt as a way to deal with mood. And you mentioned lactobacillus as, uh, yeah. as one of the, did you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, so I, I haven't seen an awful lot um, to do with that. I think I may have watched him on a podcast talking about his okay. um, probiotic at one point in time. I think it's interesting. I couldn't possibly comment on how effective it has been for the right. people he has tried that with, but I, I do wonder if there's something in that. Okay. Um, so there is some research out there that has shown positive beneficial effects in terms of probiotic use in mental health, so particularly anxiety and depression. For people listening, that means make your yogurt based on particular bacterial strains, and that might actually make you have a more optimistic outlook on life. Yes. Yeah. So I don't have any direct experience myself of using that yes. with people. Um, I think there was a systematic review that I looked at from two or three years ago that concluded there were, it was inconclusive. So there, were, there have been different studies that they've done and different researchers have found different proportions of bacteria in the same populations. And there just hasn't been a lot of consistency between the studies. Though something that, that does come out is that it tends to be lactobacillus and bifidobacterium that tend to have had the positive effects either in animal studies or in some of the more limited human studies that there have been. 
So getting out of the research and into the treatment realm, if somebody came to you with sort of uncontrolled bipolar behavior or depression, would you recommend a specific diet and expect to see changes just based on diet alone, like improvement? Yeah. So yeah, so I mean, research now, I'm talking like just clinical yeah. experience. Yeah, so my recommendation would be the ketogenic diet. So the very low carbohydrate, moderate protein, high fat diet. I'm using whole foods, concentrating on healthy fats. So not including those seed oils that I'd mentioned earlier. Yes. Um, I think it's important to pick the right time. So if somebody was acutely unwell in terms of experiencing bipolar disorder, then that's not necessarily the optimum time to start a ketogenic diet. And it can actually be dangerous in terms of exacerbating symptoms during the adaptation period. And mm -hmm. the adaptation period is generally the first two weeks or so of the ketogenic okay. diet when you can go through some electrolyte imbalances. But we do know that mental health symptoms can be exacerbated as well at those times. And somebody may need additional medication to hold them in that period. And so I think it's really important to work with a specialist who has experience in this and uh, to be guided. Have you seen uh, somebody change their diet and their mood actually improve, like overall? So I'm in a bit of a difficult situation in terms of my NHS role. So I currently work, work with the crisis team, which means I see patients when they're in crisis and when yes. they're most acutely unwell. So I haven't had a lot of experience of working with patients on an ongoing basis for people who have adopted the ketogenic diet, but I... I tend to take the tactic that I want to let people know about this as, as an option for treatment yes. and to plant the seed for them to look into it at a later time when things are more stable. Okay. Well, um, actually, so you've kind of answered a question that I was going to ask next, which is what's your opinion about psychiatric medication and the standard approach and how do you work with those two together? But I guess as a crisis physician, you have to do the meds first, don't you? Yes. Yes. So that's our main option that's open to us for treatment. I mean, I do... I've become increasingly sceptical about medications and, and personally I wouldn't be somebody who would rush to want to take medications and certainly not over long periods of time because most of the medications that we use cause insulin resistance. Yes, yes, awful they do. I, 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 I have to yeah. admit when I write a prescription I always say let's we'll do this but only as long as you need to because it's yeah. crazy. Some of these medications yeah. five years and you're pre-diabetic. Yes, absolutely. And, and, you know, we know that that can happen within less than two weeks of taking a medication. Somebody can develop insulin resistance who didn't have it pre-morbidly. So having said that, you know, I do think medications are necessary in certain situations and can be very powerful intervention and can get people over the worst of their symptoms. But I, I don't think they're a great answer longer term, as in, oh, I'll maybe rephrase that. I think they can help some people and some people stay on medications long term and they have a better quality of life as a result. But I suppose I just think personally, there's a better way of doing things. And I think that we're missing that in mainstream practice and, and missing it big time because we're not really addressing the underlying cause of these illnesses and disorders. The way the NHS is set up, there's not a functioning metabolic psychiatry service in the UK I think the only one I'm really aware of is at Stanford. But, you know, I think there is quite a movement now and I'm hoping to change that. Um, and I do know there's a lot of interest because I'm contacted by people very regularly wanting to find clinicians who can work with them using dietary strategies. You know, and wouldn't it be nice if, so I guess we can't expect that, you know, you go into the emergency and the doctor says, okay, let's change your diet. I mean, I appreciate that that's not going to happen anytime soon, uh, <laughs> even though they're coming in with, you know, a McDonald's and Coca-Cola and whatever yeah. and their cigarettes. So it's obviously that could stop, but it wouldn't it be nice if we could at least see that the hospital, the nursing home system, the, the psychiatric uh, institutions would at least have good food that they offer. Yes. But what they're offering is actually processed food, which makes all of this, any any intervention that you provide, it makes it, undermines it, I guess. Yes. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, it's, it's absolutely, it's crazy to me, for want of a better word, what I see being served in, in hospitals and even in staff canteens. It's just all processed inflammatory, inflammatory. junk yeah. food. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. I want to ask you a potentially stupid question, but you keep mentioning inflammatory. So, and that maybe that's the piece that uh, psychiatric medications are actually working on that angle too. So possible that a person could just take something like prednisone or like a super duper anti-inflammatory or just something like an anti-inflammatory like Advil or something like that. Would that have any impact? Because that's an anti-inflammatory. Potentially. So I'm not fully up to date with all the, the research. Mind, it's yes, just it crossed my mind. Like, could we just take an aspirin instead of an antidepressant? Yeah. I mean, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't rush for the steroids because I do oh. see people with um, yes. kind of steroid and just major mental disorder. But yeah, absolutely. That's true. And it, that might be part of what's happening is that there is yeah. some, some impact there. And, and then I would worry about non-steroidals because they, they give you leaky gut as well. Oh, and, uh, okay. Yeah. So there are, there are difficulties there. Okay. So I want to just get to a couple more points. You had talked a little bit about the vegan vegetarian diet uh, with your own experience, but was there more that you wanted to say? Cause you talk in the metabolic madness book, which by the way, people, every, everything that we're talking about is in that book. And it's just really quite intriguing how so many of these factors are, you know, diet related, but you talk about DHA as being a critical part of brain health and neurological development. And that, that mm-hmm. doesn't, it doesn't exist in the vegan diet. It makes me wonder about fetal development and early childhood. But anyway, do, is there, was there anything more you could add to any of that? Yeah, just that I would, I would never be able to recommend a vegan or vegetarian diet as being the optimal diet for mental health for a number of different reasons. So the DHA issue is a, is a huge issue. The brain is very heavily made up of DHA in itself. Um, you're right that it's important, absolutely crucial for brain development in early life. And vegan and vegetarian diets just do not provide so DHA. Is this, a this is a protein that the brain requires to develop? It's an acid, so I think of it more as a fatty acid. Okay. Um, so you tend to find DHA in oily fish, so salmon, sardines, those kind right. of fish have the, have this fatty acid. And in vegan and vegetarian diets, there's a different form, so a precursor of DHA, so ALA is what you find in plant foods. And, and your body has to convert, then go through a conversion process to form any DHA. Okay. And we know that that conversion process is really inefficient. So I, I think it's less than 10% of ALA actually manages to be converted. And we do know from studies that vegans and vegetarians tend to be deficient in DHA and tend not to have optimal kind of omega-3 fatty acid profiles. And But there are other nutrients in animal foods as well that I think are absolutely crucial. So particularly in red meat, so carnitine is one. And I've seen some some studies that show that carnitine reduces oxidative stress and at a neurological level in neurons. I think there's so much that we are yet to discover, but I, I think there are so many other micronutrients that are absolutely crucial in terms of biochemical pathways in the right. brain. That can't and be for, found. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Now I'm just moving on to the concept of food addictions. We, you've talked a little bit about that again in your personal experience. Any thoughts about, uh, well, actually what I want to ask you was about sweeteners. How does sweeteners fit into the metabolic health platform? Okay, so again, I would always advise people to try to avoid sweeteners if they can. And my own personal experience was that sweeteners perpetuated sugar cravings. It's been a while since I looked into it in detail, but I think you do get a cephalic insulin response from sweeteners, which I think can potentially derail all of your, your progress that you've made in terms of trying to lower your insulin levels more generally using diet. Okay. Having said that, I think... Doing a keto diet for some people, if they need to include some of the cleaner type sweeteners to get themselves onto a lower carb diet, then they they can be a good bridging tool to try and do that. But ultimately, I'd be trying to recommend that people go for whole foods and try to have a clean keto diet rather than making lots of keto treats and bakes and and desserts. I I think we're on the same page there. Okay, so now, now sort of the final area is response to your perspective. Have you had any pushback? And let's start with the family. Does your family eat the way you do? Are they on board after they've seen your sort of transformation? Yeah, so actually my husband, he has type 1 diabetes and 
he is keto now, but he wasn't for quite a long time. And, and I didn't want to pressure him in, into anything. But one day he just said to me, I think I'm just going to drop the carbs. I don't really know why I'm making this. So he would make rice with his meal that he would have in addition to what I was having. And it's been remarkable for him. So wow. his blood sugar control, he pretty much flat lines on his glucose meter. Um, he doesn't have the, the same hypos that he used to have. So he's, he's vastly lower his insulin usage but actually we make jokes because when we first met it became quickly apparent that there were times when he was hypo and it was just like his brain just wasn't working he just wasn't able to communicate yeah. in the usual way and I used to get really irritated with him so we used to have a running joke that if I was annoyed with him he should go and eat something yeah, right. um, yeah. I, I can't remember the last time he had a hypo like that it just doesn't happen and I think that's because his brain's running on ketones so even if he yeah takes slightly too much insulin and his blood sugar is technically slightly in the low range, yes. it's not noticeable at all. Because he's got um, the ketones instead. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Wow. So yeah, I, I have had some pushback in terms of kind of older family members just kind of being more set in their ways and, and thinking it's a bit odd to exclude certain food groups and, and isn't it a balanced diet? Wouldn't a balanced diet be, yes. you know, everything in moderation? Would that not yes. be better? And just not really understanding the concept of food addiction <laughs> and also the um, other benefits that I've had personally from from changing my diet. Uh, what about your book? Had, uh, how has your book been received and have you had any uh, responses about, because like I said, it's a quite a, from traditional psychiatry, it's quite an outstanding step yeah. of the norm. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I've had a, a really positive response actually to my book. So it was quite a big thing for me to put myself out there and actually write this. And I did it partly for my own personal development because I am quite a simple thinker and I just wanted to have it all straight in my own mind about how, how everything interconnects and, and interlinks. And I also wanted to be up to date with the research and to be able to make that relatable to the everyday person who's not necessarily coming from a scientific background. But I, I, I was really nervous when I put it out because I don't tend to be the sort of person that puts themselves in the public forum or pushes myself forward an awful lot. And so I felt actually and I didn't expect it, but very nervous when I heard that colleagues were buying it and other people I knew were reading it. Uh -huh. um, but I've had some really positive, thoughtful feedback from people and from people I don't know as well. So that, that's just been really heartening to, to see and to uh -huh. read. That's great. And, and as far as your work context, is has there been any pushback there, like in your more traditional colleagues and whatnot? Yeah, so I, I haven't announced my book officially oh. within my workplace, although okay. I think word of mouth, a lot of people do know about it now. Yeah. So okay. I'm not sure I have that many consultant psychiatrist colleagues who have read it yet, but... Okay. I am planning on doing some teaching to colleagues regarding metabolic psychiatry and using ketogenic diets for mental health. And so there'll probably be a, a bigger awareness at that time. Yes. Um, so if, if I were to ask you what's next for you, is it that that you're, you're planning to introduce this more to the traditional world through lectures and whatnot? Yes. And I also, you know, I would love if I could develop services to introduce this sort of metabolic therapy within within the NHS. Mm. Um, that's very early days. Whether that's going to be possible, I don't know. I suppose I'm feeling increasingly drawn to, to consider whether I need to go into private practice and take a step away from mainstream to traditional psychiatry. And that's something I'm still just mulling over and wrestling with for the okay. time being. And obviously continuing involvement in the research trial. Okay, um, good. Good. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So last question. It's our signature question. And it would be this. If you could tell a younger version of yourself something about metabolic health or something about your passion in this area now, what would it be? A oh, younger version of myself. Don't be afraid of eating fat. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, that's right. We were so afraid of it. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I was a teenager in, in the 90s and that, that was just the peak of the fat-free era. And and I went through all this, the usual stuff that I think most teenage girls go through in terms of being conscious of body image and restricting to a degree. And I, I used to eat fat-free for a long time. And I know that my body was absolutely craving for fat. So yeah, that would be my top tip is just don't be fearful of fat. 
Great advice. Okay, well, thank you so much, Dr. Rachel Brown. Uh, uh, people, you've got to read Metabolic Madness. It's really it, exactly what you said. It gives a lot of complex issues and quite understandable language and makes that connection from the gut to the brain. And that I just find that fascinating. So thank you very much for spending some time to explain the concepts to us. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me. It's okay. been really enjoyable. Thanks for joining us this week on Food Junkies, Recovery from Food Addiction. Make sure to join our Facebook group, Sugar Free for Life Support Group, I'm Sweet Enough. You can subscribe to our show in iTunes or Stitchers. That way you'll never miss an episode. While you're at it, if you found value in this show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too. Don't forget to pick up your copy of Dr. Tarman's book, Food Junkies, which is available on Amazon. If you have any additional questions, both Molly and Clarissa are food addiction professionals and work one-on-one with clients. You can find their websites and email addresses in the show notes. Be sure to tune in every Friday when our new episodes drop. As Vera loves to say, the power is ours.